Hi. I'm going to share with you today um, an experience we had last year, um, my team and I, um, solving a non-UX problem with workshops. Uh, we had a, um, a conflict between, um, or a disagreement, uh, between our marketing department and one of our game departments. And uh, we used workshops to sort of moderate that. And it actually turned into something a little bit bigger, uh, where we are sort of the official go-to guys, or maybe informal go-to guys when it comes to collaboration and workshops. And it really had an impact not only on solving the company's problems, but also um, how people viewed UX and our relationship to um, some of our stakeholders and some people from other departments that we normally don't work with. So this talk is about that. Uh, before we go into depth, a little bit about me. I have been working in games UX, uh, primarily um, started out as a games user researcher for 15 years. I am currently the head of UX at Traven Games in Munich. Uh, we have a small UX team that uh, consists of both researchers and designers. Uh, before that, um, I was at the Warner Brothers Games, or Interactive Entertainment. Um, um, and then I was at Microsoft Game Studios, where I started out um, as a games user researcher there, way back in 2003. So, let me give you a little bit of my philosophy about UX. I consider UX as a bridge. Um, we are a bridging discipline. We, in uh, games user research, bridge players with the game teams. Um, with UX design, interaction design, we bridge the ideas that the game designers have in their heads and the mechanics with the UI and the art. Um, through wireframing, and this is actually where we use most of the workshops that we do. But as I said, um, we have the opportunity to bridge different departments. And um, this actually turned out to be unexpected um, surprise of how effective it was, how needed it was, and sort of had nice side effects for our department. Uh, one thing that I would like to make clear, when I'm talking about helping other departments and not bridging the player or doing design work, you should not do this in place of, you know, the normal UX stuff. I'm not saying you become sort of an organizational help. You, of course, go in and do your day in and day out user research interaction design, but look for opportunities to help people. And in a surprising way, um, because we are, a lot of us, social scientists and are trained in moderation um, and trained in collaboration, we focus on empathy. We actually are probably some of the most qualified people to help spur collaboration within our organizations. So. So, but why is collaboration such a problem? Well, Forbes, a couple years back, did an article on collaboration, and they reviewed some of the literature. Um, and they went back 30 years and found that the term silo and this, um, this issue that kept coming up where departments would communicate within themselves fairly well, but they wouldn't collaborate, and they had problems with, um, yeah, uh, even communication and aligning one another within organizations. So this is something that's been going on throughout the years. And as we've heard before today, there are lots of common objections to collaboration, uh, be it in user research, but also other teams. So it takes too long, is one. It's too early, we have nothing to show. Come back later, we'll test it later. Design is a solitary activity. A lot of people don't want a 
whole bunch of stakeholders um, involved in design. They're afraid of design by committee. And some of the project managers, in our case game directors, are really afraid of losing their decision making uh, power or having it watered down by involving too many stakeholders. Um, this should sound familiar to some of you or most of you um, as a problem that uh, affects user research in UX. But I guarantee you there are other people in other departments in your organizations that are going through the same thing. They want to collaborate, but they get the same sort of pushback. So today I want to sort of go into addressing why workshops um, go through and offer solutions to each of these sort of perceived problems. And at a basic level, um, you should be able to trust um, your stakeholders. And trust is something that you don't earn overnight. It's something you come in every day and do something helpful. And day in and day out, week in and week out, you will eventually gain the trust of your partners, of the game teams, of others that you work with. This is sometimes particularly hard with user research. Um, if we're in service teams, we tend to you know, drop in and drop out, so we don't have daily interactions a lot of the time with uh, the core teams that we work for. Um, when we come in, even though we're good and we've you know, built up relationships and they trust us and they understand that um, when we give them feedback and it's negative feedback, that it's good medicine, but it's still we you know, come to them and we are sort of always the bearer of maybe not so good news. So this is something that um, I sort of really felt that um, we were able, through these workshops, to, to have a different experience with our stakeholders and with our design teams, where we're not coming in and being the bearer of bad news, but we're actually partners with them to help them solve their problems. So let's get into workshops. This is a favorite German wiki, Wikipedia entry of mine. Sorry, it's in German. Uh, they didn't have the English one that has all the stuff on it that, yeah, I wanted to take with me. But essentially, when we're talking about UX workshops, it's a specific type of workshop. Um, they are very structured. Uh, we'll go into that structure. Uh, they use creativity techniques. Some of them are more heads down. Some of them are more interactive. Um, but this is what we're talking about. And so I want to spend a little bit of time, you know, um, going to sort of the techniques that are out there and how I approach this. So we will do that. First, there are some good workshops that you can get just right out of the box. Um, design sprints by Google Ventures. It's a week-long process. Um, we saw a talk last year from the guys at Nordis about their experience with this. Uh, there's Design Studio by Brian Sullivan uh, that also goes into sort of a, um, a wireframing collaboration. But, and I've done both of these, but a lot of the time for both um, design and sort of the stuff that I did for the organization, I just sort of build my own techniques or build my own workshops. But I use techniques around sort of the, um, what's called the uh, design diamond. Uh, it goes with discovery, ideation, prioritization, and selection. And I'll put them here on a diagram that we can talk about them a little bit more. Um, over on the left, you usually start out, if you're going to do some kind of workshop, you have a goal. You can define the goal beforehand, it can be part of the workshop and some of the um, 
in some of the examples I gave before, it's actually part of the workshop. Um, but the main parts is discovery. You know, you come in, see what other people do, uh, get expectations from both the users, but also the stakeholders. And then you try to generate a whole bunch of ideas. You want to go for quantity, not quality. Uh, nothing's silly, nothing's out of bounds. And then at some point, you take all the ideas, all the solutions, and you begin to actually whittle them down a bit. Um, and then make a final selection. And then you have a concept. So by and large, it's nothing terribly complex, but this is how a lot of a lot of workshops are structured. Um, so I come to um, this opportunity we had last year, where, as I said before, we had a game team, one of our daughter's studios. They're making a game. It's a futuristic tactical battle racing game, and they were looking for a name. They had a um, a deadline coming up where they needed to put out marketing materials. Uh, they had already paid people. Deadlines were set. And uh, they hired a guy, a marketer, to come in and help them uh, find the name. Did a good job. Um, thorough process. Took a couple of weeks. Generated a list of hundreds of names. Pared it down. And the game director, or, or decision maker uh, for that team, made a decision. He presented that decision to management and our central marketing. Our central marketing said, while it's not bad, it's not what we want to do with the brand. Go back to the drawing board. And by the way, the marketing materials have to be out next week. Um, and so there was brief discussion uh, that I was on the sideline for, because I have a designer uh, that works for these guys. Uh, about hiring a vendor and um, having someone try to go in and uh, do something quickly for a lot of money. Maybe it will work, maybe it won't. And at some point I raised my hand and said, you know, let me try something. I run these workshops, I can do something fairly quick, I can do something within the week. Um, let me have a go at it, you know, uh, we'll know quickly. You know, we can do this within a couple of days. They said, okay, Steve, yeah, go ahead, let's try it. So I created something that I called the name finding process. It essentially um, had some stakeholders. My sort of key insight here was that the game team had delivered something without getting proper stakeholder input or involving them where they clearly wanted to be involved in this. And so instead of getting the stakeholders involved after the fact, let's get them involved before decisions are made and get their input then. So I had the game director, game designer, brand marketing manager, uh, head of marketing, we had a writer, we had localization, we had UX sort of join in for this. We prepared, we to find ideation pillar uh, with brand marketing to some tasks that we want to do in the workshop. Took about half an hour, an hour. And then we had an ideation session. It just was two hours where the whole point of it was with this group, generate a whole bunch of different names. And then from that, we would pick sort of a a final list, and that would go into a smaller group of experts for reworking that I called name smithing. On a second day, another two hour, we'd discuss the pros and cons of sort of the most popular ideas, um, talk about availability of websites, um, and eventually have the, um, the game director make a decision or decide we don't have anything, let's go on and do something else. So
So for this one, I just wanted to go through these pillar tasks. Essentially, we wanted to um, give people in these workshops different tasks that um, made them think about a whole broad range of ideas for their names, not just focus on racing or tactics. Um, part of marketing, there were a couple of different um, ideas or philosophies about this. Some people wanted um, to increase the app store optimization since this was a mobile game. And so they wanted, you know, words that were, would be typed in search fairly often. Um, but others said, hey, let's create names that are aspirational. Let's do something like Wipeout. And then we had uh, them just sort of concentrate on various aspects of the game that were important to the brand, like racing aspect, like tactics aspect, um, and a couple others. I won't go into those. And so I'm going to, then we went to the next day and actually had the ideation session. And so the ideation session started out with, you know, one, one of these tasks from the pillars, uh, create names that are, you know, aspirational. And we would give the participants five minutes to generate as many names as possible. We gave them um, uh, post-it notes with uh, thick Sharpie markers so they couldn't write too large. The media that you do this on is important. Uh, they did this by themselves, and then after the five minutes was up, they went and uh, posted it on a wall and uh, took 10 minutes to look at it, look at everyone else's, and then we voted. We did dot voting. Everyone got five votes. Um, we experimented with three to five and uh, subsequent iterations. Uh, but, and we had them vote publicly that everyone could see which um, candidates were getting more votes, which weren't. There's a good reason for this that I'll get into later. And, um, but this wasn't a final decision. The final decision was decided by the game director of you know the top maybe 10 that he took with him to the next day. And so we went through this. Uh, we went through six or seven of these pillars, collected all the names. And then the next day, they went to the um, name smithing session. I won't get into this here. Um, it's too much detail. This is sort of what I wanted to sh show you as far as just how a basic workshop looks. But it actually went well. We had a name uh, for the game that we actually used to launch it with. It's High Patrol. Um, and in fact, it worked so well that uh, the marketing team came to me and said, well, Steve, we have a couple of other games that are coming up uh, that need names. Why don't you help us do this, run these sessions? And so a couple of things. First, I have no idea if this is the right way to, to name names. This isn't, I'm not a marketing guy. So if anyone knows a better method, you know, this isn't this. This was to get us a name quickly. Um, but having said that, I said, sure, but I'm not, I'm UX. I have got UX things to do. This is a marketing, I'll do this, but I also want to train one of your brand marketing managers to take over this when I am done. And that happened. Um, we went through, had, um, I think I was on three titles that were um, named, that we found names for afterwards. Uh, most of them went fairly smoothly. We had one title that um, took a couple iterations, um, and but uh, most of the stuff that came out we used. And this method, then when I handed over to the brand marketing manager, was used by marketing and is used by marketing for our names. Um, and yeah, it was a, a pleasant sort of surprise that this worked. But what worked for me really was 
the contact that I had to the marketing. I had known these guys before, had good relationships with them, but uh, didn't work very closely with them. This started changing as I started getting more and more involved into um, activities like market placement. And so it opened not only um, a door within the game team for me to be in a little bit early, but it opened a door to the marketing team for me to, to do and collaborate with them on some of their projects. So that was particularly, um, particularly satisfying and yeah, powerful. Um, it, is, it, changes, it changed my relationship to these guys. So I want to go into a little bit of the workshop principles that I use to, and I don't want to do this on a technical level as far as the best practices go. This is just how I think about these to get people over the hump of actually wanting to do this, to overcome these objections to collaboration. There's a whole bunch of knowledge that I have about how this works best. Um, you know, tips and tricks that if you come to me afterwards and talk to me, I can share with you. But this is just how I think about these to, um, uh, to make them sort of work quickly and well and be accepted. So I have sort of two principles that are around getting the right people at the right time in the right discussion. Um, so I want to involve stakeholders up front. And this is sometimes hard to do because this is sort of counterintuitive to how games are built. Usually when a game goes into concept, you have the game director, maybe a game designer, a small core team come up with a concept. Uh, there's no reason to involve the rest of the team if there's nothing for them to work on. So they come up with the concept, when they have something to, for other people to work on, they come and give it. Um, unfortunately, with, the con with concepts, there are a whole bunch of stakeholders that want to be involved up front, and traditionally, they also get the decisions the same time the team gets them. And sometimes that worked, but in the case that I just gave you, it didn't work so well, and so, if we can get these guys involved earlier, involve them in co-creation, or at least involve them in a more meaningful requirements gathering, this is always good. Um, people need to be heard. And they need to be heard preferably before a decision's been made. Uh, the next sort of principle around this is to initiate critical conversations. So I think these workshops are the better requirements gathering in some aspects. Instead of having a checklist and saying it meets this requirement, that requirement, have a discussion about, you know, what does success look like? What are your expectations? Ask people, um, you know, how they envision, envision this because most people have that. They have their requirements checklist, but behind those is a whole sort of another layer or level of what they think success should look like for this. And this gets them to, um, to engage in that. It encourages debate and it forges consensus. Uh, get them to have these critical conversations up front. Principle 2B, 2A and 2B. Um, keep it short. Focus the discussion. As I said before, we wanted to have, uh, we didn't want people to just, in the racing example, focus on racing. Uh, we wanted them to focus on various other aspects. And so we gave them, you know, some of these pillar tasks to do it. But we also didn't want them to go off and um, go into areas where it was too broad and we would never be able to use the name. So we had three to eight of these pillar tasks. Um, eight if you, you know, have five minutes of generation, 10 minutes of discussion voting, will give you about two hours worth of content. 
so that it keeps you know keeps people on track and on focus and keeps sort of the the brainstorming yeah within scope. But the second principle is to time limit activities, and this is in any brainstorming activity you do. Um, if you let people discuss, they will discuss hours sometimes about minutia. Um, having people having time limits, time boxing this, actually get, allows you to get through a lot of content really quickly and your stakeholders and the, um, especially the uh, game directors in our case who do this, look at that and say, okay, we, that was actually productive, that was efficient. And so they're more willing to do this in the future. There's always this sort of balance or trade-off between saying limit, five minutes, and actually getting good results where the team feels that they were, they had a good discussion about this. Uh, you'll probably get a sense when you do these um, where that is. If you, if you cut people off too short, you will feel that it's not done. So maybe don't take this as a strict five minutes and then it's out. Use it as a guideline and then try to use the time boxing to at least corral the people into a efficient use of their time. Principle three, I call working alone together. Um, it goes to sort of this design by committee. A lot of the um, loud methods uh, that are called, where people talk a lot and interact a lot. Um, brainstorming is a typical example of that. A lot of people talk over one another. You have um, extroverts, you know, dominating. And with this, if you give them activities where they sit down and do something for five minutes in themselves, extroverts can't dominate, and introverts can't disengage. Everyone has to produce something. And again, it um, doesn't feel like chaos to your designers. It feels more natural. And, more is the way they work, so you don't get this sort of design by committee. The principle four is just voting and recommending. Um, this voting is good. I, I use this open vote, this public vote, um, for a couple of reasons, uh, that they can express their opinion and that they can understand what resonates. Um, we have a lot of people that think I've got the best idea or this person's idea isn't what we're looking for. And if you get, uh, you know, allow people to see what the top vote getters are, it actually helps uh, address some of this. It's like, oh yeah, this is actually not as, you know, uh, not as popular or as good as I thought it would. It doesn't resonate. And, but in this case it still allows you to do this as a recommendation and let the decision maker have um, sort of a super vote on it and decide what it does. So everyone feels heard, they understand what resonates, but it doesn't take power away from the decision maker. This is critically important. Um, your decision makers will be willing to do these things, but you have to um, give them still the power to make their decisions. So again, to wrap up the benefits, this enables and spreads collaboration. Um, the fact that I was able to um, do this marketing, they actually over, they took over this method and um, they have it now outside of UX into a di different department and it's spreading through other departments as well too slowly. But people, because they have fun with this um, and it is effective, start using it. It gets a seat at the table for you and others uh, where you might normally not have them. It gets you in maybe a little bit earlier in conception. And one of the great benefits for the UX department um, is that you're bringing others into the conversation. And if you can um, get others a seat at the table who are having the same problems with collaboration that you are, this actually is a, you, yeah, you've made a friend. Um, and this improves sort of your collaboration and your, your standing within the company. It's a quick method. 
Um, you can do this, you know, um, as far as the longer design method, you can do up to a week, but you can do this in a couple of hours. So you can do something quickly, and again, it avoids this design by committee if you actually have the people not brainstorm or get up in the whiteboard, but um, yeah, sit down and um, do stuff by themselves. So, so to bring it back to the sort of um, takeaway message I want to have is, you know, promote collaboration. You should, you should, you should use these workshops for design and even for some of the testing activities you do. But look for opportunities, whether it be, um, uh, as I said, the name finding with marketing, whether it be getting our solutions team and our payment team to collaborate together more closely on the shop that they're building. Look for opportunities to use these and it will start, number one, spreading and solving problems. It'll put you as a UX team sort of in the center of all these activities and it will build trust not only in the people you do this for, but throughout the whole company. And I've seen this happen over the last year. It's not a panacea, it doesn't cure everything, but it does actually um, speak to trust building where trust building can be hard to do, especially if you're like our user researchers in a centralized team. So thank you for listening and questions. Yes. Okay. Hi there. Oh, um, when you talked about the voting, you said that you preferred to do open voting. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, I assume the difference, the alternative is closed voting. Why did you choose open? Um, um, ex because I wanted people to see what resonates and what doesn't. Um, I think that's, that overrides sort of the influence that people can have of seeing this person vote. I usually, what I've learned is that not to have like the stakeholders vote up front, uh, or the primary decision maker vote up front, have the rest of the people vote, and then have the um, decision maker vote at the end. Okay, so I follow up, is that, yeah. Um, so it sounds like it's, you put your stickers on, you, you take your vote, but there's no kind of discussion after they voted to explain why they voted that way? Um, there can be, in this case there wasn't. Um, this goes, the discussion happens in this case in a smaller group, but yeah, this is part of sort of the process of elimination. You can discuss why you voted in with this. For the names, you know, does Hyperdrome, you know, good or bad? This is something that I would rather have professionals, brand marketers, writers discuss as opposed to everyone. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Hi there. Um, I had a question uh, regarding the process. So after you've done the, the, the voting and you've got the people on board, how does the decision maker then feed that back about the decision that has been made and how much explanation do they go into as to why they've come to that? Um, so in this case, um, basically the decision maker takes us with him and says we're going to work on these sort of candidates. Um, and we did a couple more of these. Um, it was varied. Some of the decision makers said, "This I just don't feel it, and we're going to, you know, do something until it feels right." Others had very, you know, um, well-defined pros and cons about why they did, and they discussed that with the group. And then it was communicated to the group and the larger company afterwards. And so at the end of the day, you know if it works or doesn't. If you put it out the company and you hear um, a lot of voices say, no, that, that isn't good, or okay, that's, 
that's really good or at least uh, in the, the worst case, okay, that's okay, that's acceptable. Thank Does you. that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, yeah. Stephen.